Okay, Stuart, again, thank you so much for your uh, excellent talk. And my students, my audience must have been enjoying a lot. And then obviously we have learned a lot from you. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I have been really, you know, like uh, looking forward to this opportunity to interview you about uh, some questions related to your life as a researcher and uh, also your passion towards publication and, and so on. So uh, if you can kindly answer my questions, yeah, that, that'll be great. So let's start with this question. In the presentation, you mentioned that you used to work in Japan as an English teacher. And uh, probably at that time, there must have been so many future career directions for you. And, but in the end, you decided to become a researcher. You, you, you decided to further pursue uh, MA and a PhD. So what, what made you go in that direction rather than so many other possibilities that you could have chosen? If you can share with me, that'll be very interesting. Okay. Uh, now, I, I think my answer to this question is, is probably going to be different from most of the other people that you mm -hmm. interviewed. Uh, because, uh, yeah, as you know, I, I, I went to Japan uh, on a working holiday visa uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to work, teach English language for a year, and then travel around the world for a year. Mm -hmm. And... and you know, I, I, I loved that experience. I loved being in Japan and, and, I, and I really enjoyed teaching English. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was doing that at, at language schools for, for a few years. And then someone I knew told me about uh, working at universities in Japan. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was uh, really what I wanted to do was to do a master's in business administration and, and MBA. That's so different from what you're doing now. <laughs> but, but I heard I heard about you know working at universities in Japan, and I heard that mm -hmm. a the salary was really good, which is and, true, yeah. <laughs> and b the vacation was really long. For, That's also true for foreign instructors, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and so that motivated me to do the MA in Tefl Tessel. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, you know, about my love of language. <laughs> it, was about, it was about higher salary and longer vacation. And, oh, okay. And, and so then I, I so that, and that was successful. So I, I did enjoy doing my masters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and 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 I did get jobs working at universities and colleges in Japan, and that was mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. And then. It, <laughs> Then I started thinking about doing a PhD um, because in part, because I enjoyed the research in my master's. Mm -hmm. So again, it wasn't so much about, about love of language. It was about um, job security and getting jobs with even higher salaries. At <laughs> um but but now this from here it sort of gets more typical. I, I think when when I started my PhD, I did my PhD with Paul Nation. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. Mm -hmm. Who is you know really the top person in the world for vocabulary studies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I really enjoyed my PhD. What was so what was that like? Uh, actually, oh. so how did, yeah? So how did you actually start your PhD with a uh, yeah Paul Nation? How did it happen? Well, mm. I was really lucky, I think. I didn't know I didn't know who to do a PhD with. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have you know knowledge, you know, a great deal of knowledge of the field of vocabulary studies. I was interested in vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a topic related to vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And and I knew of, you know, Paul Nation, Paul Mira, um, David Singleton, Batia Laufer. So I would I was thinking about these different people and, and you know, contacting different programs. Mm -hmm. And then I saw that Paul Nation was coming to Japan to give a talk for Temple uh -huh. University of Japan mm -hmm. in the city I lived in. And, and so I, I contacted him about, you know, meeting him and, and, you know, going out for dinner and talking about, you know, doing a PhD under his supervision. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and when I when when we talked about it, I, I remember this 
very well because you know I've been thinking about my PhD research topic for you know months. Yeah, of course. <laughs> preparing for this <laughs> big I was all excited, yeah. all excited to yeah. tell him about my amazing <laughs> game-changing research. That's right. Topic. Yeah. Or shaking. And, <laughs> yeah. Big topic. Yeah. And and, yeah. and so I told I told it to him, mm. and he sort of sat back and he you know sort of about it for you know 30 seconds and then i i remember and he said so i think you know what you're saying is you want to do this and then he said something completely different from what i had said to him <laughs> and, and he said i think that would be a great idea you know, you could set it up as a series of studies and publish each study as a separate publication. And I think it would be really great. And so I sat back and I thought, hmm, this is totally different from what I was thinking. Um, but, but he thinks it's a great idea and a great topic. So yes, let's do that. Um, now, at, at the time, I thought he just misunderstood what I said. But, but I realized later, you know, much later, that really he was just taking a not very good topic and changing it, you know, to some degree and making it a very good topic. And without me even realizing <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, I was, I, the, you know, I, I don't think I'm the smartest person, but, but I think I was smart enough to know that the, if the top person in the world thinks something is a good topic, <laughs> then that would be a good thing to do, right? <laughs> so this, this is, I think, for me... Um, the difference between having a successful PhD, it made the whole difference in my career. I, I'm sure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. if I had done the topic I had wanted to, mm -hmm. it would have resulted in nothing. So, uh, I, see. Mm -hmm. so I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be an academic now. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason that I mention this is because I have seen students, you know, you know, come with a topic that they really want to do. They're really passionate about Mm -hmm. You know, you know, when you hear the topic, it's not a good topic. <laughs> you know, it's not going to result in anything. It's, yeah, it's harsh, right? And, but uh, it's not going and, to work. <laughs> and, and, and you try to say to them, you try to say to them in, you know, in, in a number of nice ways. It's like, okay, you know, but you know what else? You know what you could do when you'd say something different? And, and I have seen students say, no, 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 no. I don't want to do you. that. <laughs> I want to do the topic I came, I came with. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, why I, I touch on this is in those instances when I've seen that happen, mm -hmm. the result for the student has been poor, you know. Um, and, and as, as, you know, these weren't my students, mm -hmm. but. You know, as a supervisor, you know you want your you know you want your students to be happy, and if, if do well. students are only going to be happy doing that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but so yeah, I, I I think that that you know choosing a topic that challenge it is a really 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 important part of of doing a PhD, wow. and I was very I was very fortunate you know that I I was able to work with you know. The, mm -hmm. the ultimate person right and 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 that was a really enjoyable experience and and working with pollination you know it really developed my interest in research and i, I mm -hmm. and coming out of that i thought well yeah i would like to be a researcher i would like to have that opportunity um, to try that and so that you know working with paul that 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 changed everything for me the the uh, anecdotal story you just shared with us is actually quite inspiring because you know we obviously assume that uh, you just you know uh, walk to the pollination and with a wonderful proposal and then uh, wow. you know you you must have been like smart you know like a child in, even from day one but I see so pollination sort of deliberately intentionally uh, misunderstood <laughs> your 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 topic I don't know. <laughs> and then. I, I, Instead, he was giving you some 
a sort of a more, I don't know, comprehensive picture of uh, what could be a good research topic. And, uh, and what was, was also really interesting to me was that uh, you immediately sensed it and uh, you followed his guidance and uh, you know, absorbing his passion and also as a top-notch uh, research. And th that part was quite a, uh, something that uh, you know, we can learn from. Yeah, I, I see. Yeah, because mm. I think, you know, when you go into a PhD, mm -hmm. you, you only have your knowledge of what you gained from your master's degree. Mm -hmm. It's very limited. Even mm -hmm. if you did great, you know, you got, uh, you know, I I incredible grades, it, you know, you only learn a fraction, you know, to be a researcher, to, to research a topic, you know, you have to read hundreds of articles about that topic. The idea is that, you know, you know more than anyone else in the world about that topic. Mm -hmm. So when you come into a PhD, you don't have that knowledge. So mm -hmm. very unlikely that, you know, people come in, coming into a PhD can, you know, judge what is a, a, a good topic and what isn't a good topic. Of course, they can say, I like this topic and I don't like that topic. And you don't want students to do topics they don't like. But yeah, I, I think that is... You know, it, it's really important, I think, that, you know, students come in flexible, a little flexible about, about the topic that they do, and make the best use of whoever is supervising them, right? Because, right. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I have a student who says they want to do uh, a topic about motivation, mm -hmm. I can try my best to supervise them with that topic, mm -hmm. but... I'm not, you know, I'm not an appropriate person to supervise that topic. You know, the student isn't making good use of me. And right. I'm not going to, you know, you know, I would be thinking, well, you should, you know, try to work with Zoltan Dornier, right? <laughs> topic, you know. Um, <laughs> see, I'm very curious, though. So is there any sort of like a specific moment that you still remember about, you know, your experience with the Paul Nation as, a, as your supervisor? Um, yeah. Well, I, 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 there's there's many there's many things. Mm -hmm. as, as I said, when when I finished my PhD, I, I felt I felt a little sad. You know, I, I enjoyed oh. the whole experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't stressful in any way. It was it was quite enjoyable. Oh, really? So uh, throughout your PhD, you actually enjoy the conducting work and learning more about the studies and vocabulary. Yeah, mm. yeah. I, you know, I, I guess. Maybe that's not fair to say it was completely enjoyable. I think you know the writing, <laughs> the writing, the Ups writing process is always is always challenging, mm -hmm. right? You know, learning how to write. Um, but you know, I, I, Paul is such a nice, kind, you know, generous, you know, positive, caring person that uh, and, you know he, he. I think I learned a lot about supervision. You know, mm -hmm. from Paul, you know, you know, getting prompt feedback. You know being willing to meet your students, you know, mm -hmm. the same day, the next day, if you can, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for your students. I, I don't, I don't pretend to, to be as, as, as wonderful as Paul, but, you know, I, I, I try to learn um, from, from that experience. And when I have difficulty, try to think, you know, in a way, well, what, what would, what would Paul do? Because, uh, uh, I see. Um, yeah, you know, because he, he, you know, he, he treated me as, he, you know, he treated me as a colleague. And I think, um, mm. uh, yeah, you know, you trying, trying to look out for your students. And it was a real privilege. You know, I, right. I think it's a privilege to do a PhD. I think it's a privilege to be an academic. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it's, it's quite a, uh, important to also tell you that the, the way you describe Paul is exactly the same the way how your students are describing you. Because... I know them very well. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're beautifully, obviously, inheriting the spirit of all nation. And, uh, yeah. Oh, so, short. Uh, actually, the uh, pr probably the main audience of this uh, uh, you know, uh, channel is uh, is my MA students at UCL, and we have a lot of MA students. And uh, mm -hmm. this is a perfect timing for me to ask you uh, this question. A lot of MA students in the UK they are doing the dissertation within like five to uh, probably four to five months, and they are currently you know uh, working so hard to find a good research topic for their dissertation. 
Mm. Mm. So this is probably the very first step to conduct, you know, independent, exciting, their own research program. Uh, mm. Do you have any advice for them, like how to narrow down and find, you know, exciting research topic for for their first independent yeah. project? Mm. Ah, that's a real challenge. And, and I understand that my MA was like that too, where you have to get your thesis done in six months. That's true. Um, yeah. So I, I, I guess I, I always think the goal of any, any piece of research is to try to get it published. Mm. So, you know, because you want, you know, if you're going to work hard on something, it's, you know, you want more than just the person who graded it to read it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I guess... The, the most important thing to begin, I think, with research is, is knowledge of the topic. You know, the more you read, the more confident you can be in the direction that you take. Mm -hmm. So that's very challenging in this situation with uh, an MA thesis that comes after doing coursework, having that knowledge. But I, I think that's, that's very important. And I guess I would start by reading the most recent papers mm. that have come out in good research journals like SSLA, language learning, applied linguistics, you know, Tisa Cordley, Modern Language Journal, you know, those journals. Mm -hmm. A lot of detail about the methodology, the justification. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would probably try to maybe just do a replication. Um, oh, that's a good point. Or, yes, Stuart. Or, yeah. mm. or just change one variable. Now, mm. it's, it, is harder, it is harder to get replications in, you know, published in top tier journals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if there's a lot of value, a lot of times at the end of a study too, they'll suggest, you know, research direct, you know, direction. So mm. could take one of those possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I would I would start with something new. You would want to look at the research and how the degree to which it, it might be possible to to conduct. You know, mm. you, you can't do anything longitudinal. You know, I'd be thinking about cross-sectional research that was a pretest, post-test design, where you're doing a pretest, maybe one week before your treatment the following week and immediate mm -hmm. test, and maybe a delayed post test if there was if that was expected mm -hmm. but you could collect your data in three weeks a short period of time um uh and you know to what degree is that possible if you're doing a replication you might be able to follow up you know on the design and the materials that the that were used, mm -hmm. um, you know, almost exactly. Now we often have open access, you know, materials and data. That's you know, true. So we, we could look at that. You know, that's a really positive feature that's come out in, in journals in the last couple of years. I also remember, didn't you write a paper in language teaching where you were proposing some like, uh, directions for replication studies? That's right. Yeah. And, and actually language, like language teaching has a replication section. So for, you know, replicated papers, Graham Port, the editor of that journal, mm -hmm. been a strong advocate for uh, replication, replication. So several publications and books about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you could look through that section as well, because every issue there is someone writing about um, studies to, to replicate. So that, that would be a, a nice thing, a nice way to start out about that topic. Mm -hmm. um, you could also, you know, I, I always think it's important to talk with instructors as much as possible, you know, oh. through courses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now that it makes it very difficult if, if you have 60 students suddenly coming to talk to Kaz. <laughs> but, but, you know, Thank you for mentioning Throughout your throughout your courses, when you talk to different instructors, you know you can always you know if there's a chance, say you know what are the areas that you know appeal to you, or are there any areas you know with short term projects that might be possible? Um, but you know I, I think that you know the more that students make use of their instructors as resources, you know yeah. that's what the instructors are there for. That's the instructors can't 
can't do everything. Sometimes students will just come and say, you know, can you tell me a topic? And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, out of nowhere, it's like, I don't have a list of a hundred topics, you know, one for, <laughs> but you know, if it's in relation to something, you know, you sometimes, sometimes, well, we often get students emailing us asking about, you know, would you be my supervisor? <laughs> and every once in a while, when someone, e when the email is particularly bad, because you know that sometimes students will send these out as like a chain mail where they're just changing like the person's name. Randomly, mm. yeah. all over the world. You, yeah. you know they're sending it to a hundred people in a hundred different areas. Mm -hmm. and, and you know that they have no chance of being accepted. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, every once in a while, and I've thought about writing something about this or even posting it on, on my site, okay. you know, explaining what to do about finding a supervisor. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I think the chances are so small, like maybe for every 50 people who contact me, maybe I might accept one. And I think it's less than that. Mm -hmm. So... So you for know, PhD, right? So at the PhD level, in order to find MA level, oh, even MA. even on MA level, I see. Mm -hmm. Well, because uh, RMA is is a full two year research project. But no, that's true. That's true. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you know what I suggest to students is that they read, you know, they find the people who they think they would like to work with, and they read some of their research so that they can start an informed discussion about potentially working with that person. Ah, that's a good tip. Mm. Um, so I always say, you know, it's like the best person to work with is Kazia Saito. He's got all of these publications coming out. You know, just read, you know, try to read three of his 10 new papers this year and ask him some questions about, you know, those papers. And maybe he might think, wow, this person, you know, knows about my research pretty well. They yeah. might be a good person to work with. You're you're guiding my students very well. I would be so happy <laughs> if someone came, came up to me and uh, you know, specific questions of my specific papers for writers. That would be the killer. But uh, <laughs> I see, I see what you mean. Okay, wow. So it, it also making it's important to make the most of uh, uh, teachers' profiles and, and make sure like uh, whom you're talking to and, and uh, that's right. If your interest and uh, your instructor's interest match, then that will be a probably very harmonious, beautiful opportunity for supervision. Yeah, because mm -hmm. students will often email you about topics. It's like, oh, I've, I've heard about your research in vocabulary studies. It's like, I would really like it if you supervised my research on sociolinguistic <laughs> business, you know, but it's kind of like, mm, <laughs> you know, or you know, motivation okay. or something different, right? It's like, wow, <laughs> there's some kind of like a strange jump. <laughs> yeah, but I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're very, very good. So, uh, in short, uh, uh, let's move on to the uh, next question. Now, <clears throat> oh, well, this is something I have been really, you know, wanting to ask you about. So, you're of course very good at research and publications. But also, this is what I really like about you. You're very passionate about publications, especially at the good journals. So why is it important to publish research in such venues, especially you know, top tier good journals? And this could be a good advice for many PhD students and young scholars, because believe it or not, uh, this message itself, you know, that it's important to publish in you know, top journals. Sometimes you don't hear that so often from, from your supervisors or, you know, certain mm -hmm. teachers. So, but I, I really like you being very explicit about it. And, and I really want my students to hear from you. Okay, but your, your students can hear from you about this because you're always publishing in the in top. <laughs> <laughs> but I want my students to know that this comes from you. <laughs> I okay. am positively influenced by Stuart Webb. So. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, I, I, think that, I, I think that quality research um, often has intricate methodologies, research designs, mm -hmm. and in the top research journals, the, the, the publication standards for the methodology, the results, you know, they have to be transparent. They have to be replicable. 
these are, are really positive features of those journals. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason also why those you know, journals like SSLA, Language Learning, Modern Language Journal, you, know, you can submit papers that are 10,000 words or, or e even longer. So they have transparency, you know, in, in terms of their, their research, their research designs. They have very rigorous review standards. Mm. So, you know, I, I think, I, think I, I might have had six reviewers once for a study um, in, in language learning eventually. You know, I, I think, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, you, you, you submit and you get. <laughs> Did you say six, six reviewers? Well, not, not at, at the start. I think uh, it probably started at three in the and, end. you know, gradually got, got, got bigger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that to some degree, that's probably because some people probably disagree. Yeah, that's true. Um, or maybe I'm just making the six up. Um, I'm sure I've had five. I'm sure I've had five. Um, and but, six could be really possible, especially in language learning. Yeah, <laughs> I can definitely right. tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, language learning is a, is a wonderful, a wonderful journal. And, and and the when when you have that rigorous review process, you know, it, it helps the quality of of a paper mm -hmm. uh, that the reviews are good. And you know, reviews. Reviews, um, you know, range, I think, in their quality for, for various reasons everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So um, with those top journals, they, they tend to put out, you know, a, 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 a high quality. You know, they almost always, you know, you, there's, there's always going to be things that you disagree with. And I think disagreement in, in research is, is fine. It's, it's mm -hmm. all. Uh, but the, the quality of top tier publications, it, you know, it, it, it is very high. Mm -hmm. it, of those journals is very high because they're the first journals that most people go to look at, right? So for many journals, for me, you know, if I want to check, uh, you know, what's come out in journals, well, I, I go to those top tier journals first to see. And, and you know, and it might take me, a couple of years in, in a much further journal to find a study that's come out that I might be very interested in just because there's so many journals to check. Right, that's so true. There's just millions of journals, especially including online ones. So mm -hmm. yes, actually students, a lot of students came up to me and asking like, okay, so how can I find uh, good papers? And uh, your advice on the, you know, the, uh, the status of the good journals, that, that's it. I mean, rigorousness of the good journals. That's a really good one because uh, that's, you know, students don't have like so much time anyway. So mm -hmm. it's, it's good to know which journals are actually are really sort of like well known and uh, with a rigorous review process, meaning that the quality of paper is actually uh, quite strong. <clears throat> yeah. And, and, and please note that, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of great, there's lots of, of course. Great, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and I, I could, I could list 10 <laughs> others, which are, which are excellent, you know, with, <laughs> with, review processes and, and, and great editors and, you know, consistently excellent articles. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, as a reader, you learn from those journals um, mm -hmm. and which, which is a positive. And as an author, uh, if you can have research published in those journals, it tends to have higher impact. And mm. when, when you're starting out, I think, you know, in a way, it's almost you're just trying to get as many publications as you can to help, mm -hmm. you, to help you get a job. Mm -hmm. But after that, then when you're starting to look for promotion, um, mm -hmm. you start to look at the impact and and you start, you know, looking at higher quality, you know, publications and, and better ideas. And I, I can illustrate this with uh, and I, a conversation I had with Paul Nation, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, please, I, please share when, with us. When I first started working at Victoria <clears throat> University of Wellington, so mm -hmm. be there and about you know a few years later five mm -hmm. years later, i started working there and i remember one day paul suggested that we talk about you know ideas for for good research topics for possible students you know phd mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. and you know i i had a list of about 10 things that i thought were excellent <laughs> i was confident 
that they could all result in publications, you know, good mm-hmm. publications. <laughs> so I, I, I told mine to Paul and, you know, he said, okay, those, those seem like good topics. And then he told me his topics. Oh. And I was like, Ooh, I would like to do all of those topics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> so, so my topics were, I think, publishable, but his topics were, I think, groundbreaking. In- <sighs> And, and and I think from about then I started, I think, maybe to distinguish between, you know, getting something published um, and, you know, trying to do research that would have a, a higher impact. Like, I think I was always trying to do research that had, you know, high pedagogical impact, but, but you know, there, I think there's a big, there's a big difference sometimes. And if, if I go back to some of my earlier studies, you know, I, I can understand why they haven't been impactful. Uh, <clears throat> and, and and so now I think with topics for students, for myself, I, you know, I, I try to do things that I think will have as much value as possible to the, to the research community uh, as well. That's actually, yeah, it's, it's also really crucial uh, and relevant to many uh, PhD students, especially, uh, you know, like a early stage, because uh, uh, I see it's good to have uh, this sort of like notion of uh, rigorousness and also quality and impact. Uh, I see. So it's, it's easy. To, uh, it's, we shouldn't say like it's easy to publish many papers, but uh, it, it is possible to publish a lot of papers, but uh, it's in the end, essentially, obviously, when it comes to promotion and so on, it's good to think about the uh, impactful topics, which will lead to a lot of citations and uh, uh, probably like, like, yeah, I mean, probably leading to your even <clears throat> your own independent topics. Well, I, I think I think as researchers, you know, to some degree, we fall in love with our topics for a little mm-hmm. bit, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm sure you can relate to this because you're involved in so many different projects. And, mm-hmm. and we start a project and we think, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is a great topic. I'm really excited about this. But eight months goes by and you're working on this and you're working on all of these other things. And slowly, just like a relationship sometimes, it's like, <laughs> I'll do a little bit less now. And, and you, you, I'm really, I'm really excited about you. <laughs> about you all the time. Um, it, it's like, you know, you've been very nice and we had a, we had a wonderful time together and everything, but... <laughs> I um, see. <clears throat> that's yeah. a really good one, actually. That's so true. Like us, we were spending a lot of uh, our time. Uh, uh, I mean, you obviously spent more years, but uh, that's true. We we have been involved with so many projects, and initially, we likely have a very same level of passion and uh, excitement. <laughs> but as the time goes on, you're really right. Some of them continue to attract a lot of attention from myself and I, I, I can't mm. s- stop you know mm. researching this topic versus others are somehow f- fading away thinking of how we felt about these topics uh, you know initially so thank you that's <laughs> that's a really good <laughs> analogy <laughs> thank you Stuart. okay so uh, oh so related to this uh, so as probably everyone can see, I, I'm actually a huge fan of uh, Stuart Wolf. Uh, so I have read, I think, most of your papers, I must say. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, uh, if you can pick, if you can pick, like, what would be the most unforgettable paper, <laughs> uh, you know, that uh, you have worked on so far? Because you have ha- had a lot of papers. But do you have any like a uh, favorite? Paper, unforgettable experience, related um, paper. Mm. You know, I, I, I think again sometimes we we get a, a, attracted, uh, you know, what's new and, and exciting. So what what comes to mind there for me, mm. um, I, I, I think that the work of Akifumi Anagisawa, who is a PhD student who just graduated last year. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I, I think that the three studies he did for his PhD, because um, we did an integrated article PhD, which mm-hmm. means that instead of writing a, a long thesis, the thesis is made up of three 
intact articles that get submitted to um, journals. Mm -hmm. and, and I think his research is, is really, really exceptional um, and exciting. Um, it, it sort of follows up uh, Laufer and Holstein's involvement load hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I think Takumi Uchihara, a, a, another student who, PhD student who graduated last year, who you mentioned, I, I think the work that he did, um, which is looking at learning the spoken form of words and is an area that has sort of been, uh, it, it hasn't got a lot of attention in terms of vocabulary research. And I, I think that research is, is really exciting too. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, um, I'm giving a lot of love to Takumi and Aki, I guess, in this in, right now. But we, we also did a paper that came out in Modern Language Journal uh, uh, in December. It was published. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a meta-analysis about intentional vocabulary learning. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that paper to me, I think, is a really important paper. Um, that that uh, I'm very excited about. Uh, but as we mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago, all of the different studies you do over time, you know, you feel passionate about, and you know. <laughs> so you know, we, you could talk about a paper here Does and there. There's, <laughs> there's probably two or three papers that you that if you mentioned, I would say, yeah, no, not that one. But but a lot of them, a lot of them I you know, I, I I really liked. But but those ones, I, I think are. Going to be like always uh, uh, staying as a sort of your unforgettable papers. So uh, uh, this is something that we always you know uh, sort of discuss for fun. But uh, sure, maybe uh, uh, you know you can share with uh, uh, like eager uh, you know passionate uh, young researchers about uh, what would be the tips for publication in a good international journals uh, and obviously there are so many uh, opinions but it's good to hear you know, from you like, you know personally like what you think what do you think okay hmm. okay uh, yeah I, I think this is something i've thought about a lot <laughs> oh. um, hmm. so i you know I, I i think to begin with you know starting starting with the topic um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i i think that there's hundreds hundreds of topics, you know, hundreds of, of decent topics out there. So I, I don't think people should just start with the first one that seems reasonable. I think, you know, they should think of, you know, a number of different topics and then, you know, focus on the one that has probably, you know, the great, you know, might have the greatest impact. Um, you know, that's more likely to lead to publication than the others. So I think you want to start with the topic, um, and then I think in terms of of publication, I, I think that the things that are really key are the methodology. You can't you can't get something published if there are methodological issues. Um, you know, no, no. I, I should just. Um, also state, you know, no study is, is perfect. You know, I, I think if we go back to our earlier work, we would probably change everything to some degree. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be perfect, but I'm saying it shouldn't have any clear methodological weaknesses. It has to have a strong methodology um, because without that, you know, chance of publication is, is, is very That's slim. Mm. Um, and the thing after that, I think there's two more things. Um, the justification has to be really strong for the research. It has to be very clear, very strong. And, you know, one of those things, you know, when you review papers and, mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you read the introduction, you read the literature review, and then you get to the end and someone's sort of trying to put their justification there. And they say something like, you know, this will shed light on, you know, voca second language vocabulary learning. And it, in a way, it's almost like that sentence is their justification. And it's like, that's not strong justification. You could say that about, about every paper that's submitted. You know, so, <laughs> so when you're writing your introduction and your literature review, you know, you need to be, you know, before you start writing, you need to think, well, what are the, what are the clear reasons, mm. you know, 
my justification is strong here. And I, I usually refer to Alison Mackey um, oh. as someone someone who I think does does a great job of justification, you know, within some of her articles. Um, oh wow! Mm -hmm. in, in that, you know, I remember when I was teaching a methodology methodology course, you know, you know, looking at one of her articles and saying, "Well, look, you know, here she has." Um, pedagogical justification. Mm. Right? Here she has theoretical justification. Here she has methodological justification. Now, I don't think you can always have, you know, those three types of justification, you know, within a study. But I think you have to remember when, when reviewers are reading a paper, they're not, you, you wrote the paper because you're feeling, you know, Mm -hmm. excited, passionate about this topic. The reviewer is volunteering to do something, you know, on a Sunday when they'd rather be doing something else. They haven't thought about this topic necessarily at all. Mm -hmm. so your job is to show them, you know, why this is a good topic, why this is an important topic. Mm -hmm. And so going back to what I was saying with Alison Mackey's paper sometimes, you know, if you're not interested in the theoretical justification, well, you might be interested in the pedagogical justification. Uh, if you're not interested in that, you might be interested in the methodological justification. Right. You know, so if you've got, you know, clear justification outlined in several different ways, you're more likely to hook your reviewer, uh, you know, to, to engage with the rest of it. Um, uh, if, you get to, if you get to the end of the literature view and you can't really see much reason for, you know, the research being conducted, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I can see the reasons, but it hasn't been put there, right? Right. And that can be fixed. You know, poor methodology can't be fixed, but, you know, justification can be added. So, so justification, I think, is the second thing. And the, the last thing I think is, you know, you want to have interesting discussion of your findings. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, sometimes some people do a poor job of that, you know, because the discussion of your findings is in a way talking about the value of your research. So <laughs> if there's little there apart from just restating the findings, <laughs> That's also kind of suggesting there's little value, you know, right. in, in the research. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to have, you know, those things. You want to have a, a, a strong methodology, uh, strong justification, and an interesting discussion. And I think, you know, for, together with a, a good topic. And I think the reason that, you know, good quality research takes time mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. that, you know, it takes time to do this. Like, I think, you know, the minimum for a good research project is a year, really. I see. Um, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's possible to do research faster um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At, at, at a high quality, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always plan for at least a year. Mm -hmm. I see. So obviously the final thing is the spending a lot of time on planning and implementing. And it was also quite a, uh, interesting that uh, you had, uh, you talked about Alice Mackey as a sort of like a you know, template. So she, she's very good at providing a several different justifications uh, for reviewers with uh, probably different kinds of mindset. And you're different, right? Some reviewers probably are more pedagogical oriented, others are more theoretical oriented. Uh, so uh, I'm telling my students, we can read Stuart's papers from that angle. <laughs> how, how short you are actually providing a justifications, uh, you know, in a unique way, yeah, thinking of different kinds of reviewers in, you know, in your head. So that's it's, it's something, thank you so much. This is really, really uh, insightful, thank you. And uh, probably let's end this interview with this uh, philosophical question that uh, uh, actually, uh, obviously I have been really interested in hearing from you and also uh, your fans from Japan explicitly asked me to, uh, explicitly asked me to ask this question. Uh, actually, a very simple question. What would be, in your view, what would be the future of L2 vocabulary research? 
<laughs> to, to me, the, the field has grown like so exp exponentially and thanks to you and mm. obviously a lot of young scholars and established scholars all over the world, everyone has a different opinions, but in your view, yeah. yeah, what kind of topics will continue to you know, grow and what, what will be the field like, let's say in 10 years, 20 years? Ooh, that, that's a really difficult question. Mm. Um, and and I, I think that it's, it's not just doing the same old thing again and again and again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there is a need. There's always a need to provide further evidence. Uh, I think before we did this, at one point we were talking about how, you know, when is a research question answered? And I would say, you know, it's never clearly answered. You know, it's, we have research questions and then we have answers in whatever context we research. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more evidence for a lot of things. So we can keep doing the things that we've done, but I, I think we need innovation. We need to look at new things, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the box. And I think to me, what is, is often most exciting about research is you know, when you see people looking outside of the box. So, you know, in a way, the, the talk today was about television. And television, when I first started talking about television, there was nothing on second language television. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, people are, people are starting to do it more. There's a few centers, I think, of excellence related to television. University of Barcelona, KU Leuven, uh, University, um, Ghent, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Michigan State, mm -hmm. and, you know, hopefully more, more people will, will do work in that area. But, but I think it's, well, what can we do next? And, and I think, you know, we, we should continue, you know, we should look at things like, like testing. In, in 2013, I believe, Yosuke Sasao and I had an article out in, in RELC Journal about innovation and testing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always think it's, it's surprising how, you know, people just keep doing the same thing or using the same tests. And I think, you know, we, we should be seeking to, to improve on things. And, and I think, um, actually, that's, that's something that Yosuke Sasao, I think, did a spectacular job of. Um, uh, Yosuke Sasao's at Kyoto University in Japan. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but, but I, yeah, I think looking at new directions is, is interesting. I think Takumi, uh, Uchihara looking at, you know, learning the spoken forms of words. I think that's really exciting. Uh, I think uh, uh, I have another Japanese student, Emi Iwaizumi, who's sort of following that up. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, I see. And, and I think that's interesting. I have another student, Johan Jin, who is looking at incidental vocabulary learning within the classroom in different ways. And I think that's quite exciting, too. Right. Because it's new. All of these all mm. of the topics present challenges. The reason I think that they haven't been done to some degree is because they are, you know, tend to be more challenging. Television's more challenging to research than written text. But yeah, so I, but there's a lot of value to these things. And I think we, we want to, you know, go in new directions and look. It must have been very challenging for you to start researching on television because as you beautifully presented today usually people have a very typical you know bias you know or opinion towards it you know nobody actually probably at that time nobody really thought of like television as a source of like learning it's like a kind of like distracting <laughs> you know factor yeah you know? so mm, so but you obviously like that challenge yes at that yeah, time. I, I, mm. I, I do i i think I think the justification, you know, is likely to be much higher as well when we think about things in a new way, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so if you go back to testing, if we're going to develop another test of form, meaning, connection in a slightly different way, well, okay. You know, if we de develop a test of, you know, collocational knowledge or derivational knowledge mm -hmm. or knowledge, you know, well, we have the word part test now. But, you know, there, there's a need for other kinds of tests, innovation, and that can be scary, I think, but I see. It, it, 
it can be much more rewarding if it's if it's successful. I'm very much wondering how it was like, you know, the, how you felt when you sort of like started working on this topic of TV and, and, you know, started submitting your papers to journals. Did reviewers immediately like your paradigm? Or well, <laughs> what was that like? Because <laughs> it was yeah, quite well, new at that time, right? Mm. Actually, with television, it was a huge success right from the start. Oh, really? So they immediately bought this idea quite smoothly. Mm. I think because, you know, television is such a big part of society. Mm. And there was there was really strong justification for looking at television as as a language learning resource and, and nothing had been done. Yeah. So so I, like I think when we look at other things, so the the study that Nusha Pavia led um in 2019 on listening to songs you know mm -hmm. that's you know people can relate to songs you know songs music is a, a large part of our culture so right you know saying well we haven't looked at you know incidental vocabulary learning through listening to songs it makes sense to look at that topic so there's a lot of things like that out there mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it and, and we're building on earlier methodology. So sometimes it can be it can be challenging, but it can also be very rewarding. Yeah, I see. Now That's... I have a question for you. Oh, do you you have a question for me? <laughs> yes. Because... This is your first time to be asked a question in a in an interview, but I, yes, please. Yeah. Now, about six months ago, I was fortunate enough to hear from uh, Kazuya Saito uh, telling me that he believed there was a really, really exciting new area of research related to vocabulary learning and speech, I believe. Groundbreaking. <laughs> Groundbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel comfortable telling your audience what <laughs> is? Okay, audience, this is quite a funny because I just sent a very sort of like a random quick email to Stuart and you know, saying something very quickly about, oh, Stuart, maybe we can work on something you know, related to speech and vocabulary. And uh, I thought you sort of like uh, forgot about it, but <laughs> you obviously you remember and uh, you're not. <laughs> Raising actually, the yeah, I actually told you not to tell me at the time because I thought, oh no, not another project. I have I'm involved in so <laughs> it's uh and so you don't actually need to tell me today, but but for viewers, I think you know they should also know that you know uh Professor Saito also <laughs> You know, works in vocabulary and is 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 working on on topics. And we we you know we just worked together. You know, working together with Takumi Uchihara, you know, who, who was was fortunate to have uh, mm. your input from, as well as Pavel Trevinovich. Mm. Yeah. Well. yeah. So. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So first of all, in response to the question coming from uh, Stuart, which is the first time ever on, on this channel, but uh, I'll definitely create another video where. I'm, I'm going to talk about our future, you know, brilliant collaboration. I think probably that could be quite interesting, especially for uh, graduate students, you know, uh, all over the world. You know, so sometimes it's, it's fun to sort of share our, you know, sort of uh, initiatives and uh, yeah, up, up to the thinking of what, what, what will come next. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm also very much impressed. I, I mean, I have known about it already, but uh, the, your family, basically, your students are also working on the cutting edge topics, and I'm pretty sure they have uh, benefited a lot from your inputs and uh, your encouragement and so on. So I see the field will uh, continue to grow and then we'll probably see more uh, of the uh, probably great work from Stuart Webb, uh, you know, his team. And uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, uh, Stuart, for joining this uh exploratory <laughs> YouTube project. And uh, actually my students really uh, like this series. So uh, I, I'm pretty sure they will love this and they may contact you and they may come to you for PhD, <laughs> PhD and so on, but uh, yeah, please be ready. And uh, so everyone, uh, pl uh, please uh, give him a big applause. And uh, 
there may be a, another invitation coming in your way. <laughs> yeah, because I really, really liked his talk. And also this whole interview was very uh, inspiring. So thank you, Stuart. Yeah, it's, see you see you very, very soon. <laughs> thank, thank you. It's been great talking to you. And I hope to see you next time at, sometime soon at UCL. Because uh, I'll, I'll be trying to come back because uh, you have such a great team there and, mm -hmm. and everybody there. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. I'm very, very happy to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Jean-Marc Devoyet. The research I'm presenting today is communicating emotions. It's like the ultimate linguistic challenge. What made you decide to become a researcher? My decision came after secondary school teaching. I was slightly annoyed by lack of autonomy and liberty to do what I felt would be a good thing in the classroom. And then when this job came up at, at Bergbeck, it was in fact because of Professor Larry Selinker had met him at a Euroslav conference in Finland. I think he called my colleagues in French, oh, you need to interview this guy. I met him at a conference. He's good. <laughs> what is important to find a good research topic? I, I, I think it, it, it's a gradual process. As I was a teacher of French, mm -hmm. I, I was interested in the, the learning process that my students went through. Then I had interesting conversations with colleagues who worked in psychology, say, you know, you could use this personality questionnaire and, and, mm -hmm. and measure this and that. And I didn't know anything about statistics. And I thought that was fascinating. It's like a, a new toy. And I think that this interface between applied linguistics and, and, and psychology mm. still has a lot to offer. Mm. I think it, it is nice if you are well established in one research discipline mm -hmm. to see whether you can adopt something from a neighboring uh, discipline neighboring disciplines mm -hmm. that allows you to throw new light and new understanding on the things that, that you are interested in 